Hey everyone, welcome to Rad Lab. Um, my name is Brendan Byrne. I am the Studio Lab Manager for the Council on Science and Technology at Princeton University. And so, yeah, this is Rad Lab. This is our weekly broadcast every Wednesday at 8 p.m. And on these occasions, um, someone from the Princeton community, you know, student staff, faculty uh, comes on our show and tells us about something they like, something they know a lot about, something they want to know more about, um, and they speak for a little bit and we hang out on the Studio Lab Slack channel and we ask them questions and learn more about who they are and what they're into. Um, it's a pretty fantastic setup. Um, one of the key aspects of it is that it's not very stressful. Uh, it's informal. Um, we like to keep things pretty low key. Uh, I think around Princeton, there's a lot of, there's a lot of stress. There's, uh, an expectation to perform and represent yourself as a professional, but here it's okay. You can be, you can be kind of weird. You can talk about things you don't know a lot about. And I say that because tonight I'm going to be talking about something I don't know very much about, and it's going to be a little chaotic, but I'm happy all of you have joined me this evening. I'll be talking about Orca, which is a music sequencing programming language slash uh, graphic programming language slash visual programming language. And it's like, why are you making all those distinctions? Uh, we'll get to that later. But it is interesting because usually um, programming languages fall in like kind of the text editor category or kind of the, the graphic programming language where you've got these modules and you're connecting wires to them. And within the module, you're maybe doing some programming in there or you're tweaking numbers. And Orca is a, a little bit different. You are using text um, and you're also working on a grid. You don't have the luxury of connecting uh, parts at any distance that you please or tweaking the modules themselves. So you're very constrained. Uh, and that's kind of wanna that's kind of where I want to get started with this this idea of constraints. Because uh, when we make things, we're always limited in some way. Um, we um, whenever we write, we're limited to the the words we know and the letters in the in the alphabet if you're writing in english um or if you're making music you're limited to the the notes that are available to you or maybe your knowledge of the instrument that you're playing and of course these aren't really thought of as limitations because the combination of these um these parts is almost limitless and you can still be incredibly expressive with them but you still have some limits. Uh, you know where the barrier is and you can always decide to transcend it or work um, within it or shrink your, your range of, of tools, of, of parts that you'll be using to make your thing. You gotta make your thing. Uh, okay, so let's get started talking about Orca. I'm going to switch my window. Please work. Okay, that's not bad. Could be worse. I just have to do one thing here. Okay, cool. So yeah, this is um, Rekka and Devine's web page on um, itch.io. If you haven't heard of itch.io, it's pretty much my favorite place on the entire internet. Um, itch.io is a place for indie games, a place for amateur game designers predominantly, but people make tools and they produce assets and they also make different pieces of software that kind of fall out of the scope of, you know, like the Google Play Store or um, the Apple App Store. It's just kind of a place where people are making weird things all the time, uh, and they find an audience here. Um, so I really encourage you all to head over to itch and just like find something neat. 
but this is their web page, and you can see it's pretty black, uh, and there seems to be a lot of visual consistency across their different projects. Um, you'll also probably notice that there aren't a lot of dollar bill signs. Um, they only sell a few of their, um, their programs that they make, and really the ones that they're selling are, are games or, or digital novels, um, things that required like a lot of work and a lot of heart to produce. Um, but these other things that you see up here without dollar bill signs on them are mostly their, their tools that you can download and you can play around with to make things. One of the other things you might notice is that the Windows, Linux, and Apple logo appears at the bottom of everything. Oh, we got a little Android over here. Um, this isn't as common as you might think, especially for amateur designers. Uh, sorry, I didn't mean to say amateur, but not super professional, super trying to get your trying to get your money, trying to be trying to be um, you know get the biggest market as possible. Like doing this is kind of a bit of a challenge, and this is all going to make sense as we talk more about their design studio, but. There's a lot of cool things to check out here. We're going to be talking about Orca tonight, so let's head over there. Right on. So here's the website. Got a bunch of grids. Wow, your your canvas, your blank canvas for making music. Very cool. Um, cool cartoon character. Some some vibes here. You know, some uh, some aesthetics um, that are trying to make you trying to make with you vibe with. Um, with these with these images, it's actually a little a little strange because I find this background image uh, to be in pretty stark contrast with a lot of the aesthetics that they're working from and a lot of the ideas that they're working with. This is some pretty like like Pacific Northwest bouge, like bourgeoisie. It's uh we'll get to we'll get to their politics in a minute, but. It seems pretty it seems pretty wild to me. We're gonna keep going. This presentation is gonna be out of control. Um, so I'm just like, okay, work is really cool. I'm gonna play around with it one day. But I'm poking around their site and I find this other project that they've done called Oquoni. Uh, and it looks pretty cool. This uh, this isometric layout is like really expressive and like, hey, this looks like a pretty cool game. Couple months later, uh, as in maybe last month, I'm reading a book on the ZX Spectrum, and it's like, oh, what the hell is that? Well, the ZX Spectrum was. Oh, let's change slides. Okay, so this is the ZX Spectrum. It's a a beginner computer, and it was produced primarily in the UK, and they sold five million of these things. Uh, it was released by Sinclair and. The president of that company, Clive Sinclair, was uh, knighted for his contribution to um, educating the UK in programming and amateur hobbyist computer computing and programming. Um, made a huge impact. And one of the reasons it did that was because it kind of flew under parents' radars. I mean, I think the idea of, of games wasn't like, you know, you weren't going to go out and spend a couple hundred dollars on a computer so your kid could play video games. You needed them to learn stuff. And so this kind of presented itself as a an educational uh, computer. You would take it home, take out your books, take out your, your magazines and learn to program using it. But you'd also play really cool games on it. It wasn't really designed for games. I mean, it was designed to support text characters, primarily, um, ASCII characters, and it had a very limited color palette and a very limited processing capability to make, like, cool graphics. Um, but one of the things it did was force um, programmers and game designers to become very creative with uh, how they made their work. Um, and so... This game, I don't even know what it's called, but it's 
it's part of a collection of games from for the ZX Spectrum that used a, a isometric layout to kind of create this like depth, you know, this looks like, whoa, I'm like there, I'm like looking into another world. And so this was like pretty effective in getting people's attention. And it's still pretty striking to this day, um, to the point that you can still find um, really like AAA games or maybe like AA games uh, still coming out uh, that are in an isometric style. So, ta-da, they're doing that. And the other thing I want to say about the ZX Spectrum is that one of the ways that made it very challenging to program on was that um, it had a low screen resolution. And then even further than that, its screen was broken up into these kinds of uh, character blocks. Um, and you could, you could program each character block, but you could only use two colors. So you can see within all of these squares, you're only using two colors at a time yellow and pink here, yellow and white, you could never have three colors at the same time. So in order to create an image like this that you see over here on the, the right, it was pretty challenging. Uh, this is quite the feat. I would even go so far as to guess that this is a, a contemporary image um, kind of created in the style of the ZX Spectrum's constraints. Um, because back in the day, I just don't think people had like the patience or really like the cultural skill that had developed to the point to design images like this. But go ahead, prove me wrong, you know, reverse Google image search this thing and be like 1983, you know, someone made this thing. But yeah, uh, I'm, I'm really interested in this thing. Uh, one of the things I really like is that it doesn't have a mouse, you know, you're really just jamming on it with keys. Um, you don't even see directional arrows. So it's kind of like, okay, that's a little daunting. Uh, what you see are the characters of the alphabet, and then stacked on top of each character are multiple functions. I mean, if there wasn't a 30 second delay on the YouTube uh, stream, I'd say someone pick a letter, but I'm gonna go with R. So let's look at R. We got R, we got this little bracket, we got run, int, and then verify. I mean, all of those functions are associated with one key. Uh, why am I going through so much trouble to explain this? Well, when we look at our environment for, oh gosh, oh no. Oh, thank God. Okay, when we look at our environment for, um, oh gosh, Orca, you're gonna see something Pretty similar. I'm trying to uncomment this real quick. Oh, my headphone cable was caught underneath the control key, so I couldn't press it down. We're in trouble here. I'm gonna uncomment this. Hmm. Oh, I see. Woo! This is a little sneak preview of what we're going to be listening to later. Um, okay, so yeah, you're going to notice that we have a grid, a grid based screen uh, broken up into character blocks where no two colors, no three colors occupy the same space. Um, you're also going to notice that this is an environment that you can navigate entirely with your keyboard. I don't need my mouse, even though I can't use my mouse, you know, it's a big convenience. We're not going to give up our mouse, okay? Uh, as long as we have it, we might as well use it. But uh, I'm someone who injured my hand a few years ago uh, designing something with a mouse uh, and playing too much Dark Souls, and so my hand still hurts occasionally. So just like hanging out and typing out some programs um, with your D-pad and your keyboard and having each key have kind of like a secret world hiding behind it is like really cool. I feel, so I kind of jumped into the aspects of Orca. Before I talk about all the secrets behind the keys, I just want to talk a little bit more about the studio that produces these programs. Um, and so that is, 
Rekka and Devine's company that they call 100 Rabbits. And one of the reasons I want to sh go through so much trouble to share this with you is because I think it's actually really cool. Um, so I've got my MFA in design and I've got all these like opinions about like what good design is um, and how you create good designs and kind of most importantly, how you feel good about your own work. Um, and we got this minimalist setup and we got this about us mission philosophy. Well, it's kind of, isn't that all the same thing? It kind of isn't, they break it out. Um, so let's start going through some of these. Um, we get a little, who are you? And, oh, we operate a small research studio called 100 Rabbits aboard a sailboat. What? And they want to see the world. They want to learn languages. You know, that's cool. Um, but they're basically on this boat sailing around the Pacific Ocean uh, making cool software. Just the two of them. And that's pretty that's pretty rad right off the bat. And I want all of you, you know, if you're watching right now, just take a minute to think about what's that what what that is like. Um, like if you were in a boat with someone else and that was it, and you were there to create work that other people in the world would um, appreciate and be like, hey, you're doing great work. Um, thanks. Like, who would you take on that boat with you and spend like several months with uh, collaborating and coming up with projects with? Um, let me just say, it can be someone you know, it can be someone you don't know, and it can be someone who doesn't exist. Uh, <laughs> like, fictional character, anything like that. If you have any ideas, just drop it. Drop it in the Slack. I'd love to hear what people are thinking like what they would want to do on a boat but anyway i'm kind of getting off i'm getting kind of getting off course um but really what i'm trying to get at is this environment beyond just whatever kind of um philosophies or mission that uh 100 rabbits may have you are in like a pretty intense environment that's going to change the way you feel the way you work the way you think and i think all of that, you know, gets reflected in this very tight aesthetic, um, this very deliberate process and this very deliberate distribution. And more gets revealed um, when you kind of keep reading. Uh, they have this um, mission to use low, to like use as little energy as possible. And that's pretty cool. Um, they also want to do things open source. Open source, no DRM. If you don't know what DRM is, you got to look into it on your own. It's super important. I think about DRM pretty much every day, especially when I'm purchasing uh, software for purchasing or downloading software for the Studio Lab. Like, if it is DRM, it's pretty much like a recipe for me losing like 10 to 20 hours of my life trying to figure out how to <laughs> budget for it and license it for all of you. And there's so much great software out there in the world. Like, why don't we all just like use DRM free licenses? Um, there's also, boom, if you've got the time, click on this thing called specific tasks and you will get just this super, super sharp, uh, approach to how you, they want to be making things. And I don't think this is someone from their studio, but it's kind of this, um, I don't know what to call it, but basically a practice. Um, I don't want to say ideology, but it probably is, but that's so political. Um, it's okay if it's political, but you know, when you are able to express clearly how you want to make things, you are able to collaborate with people much more easily and draw them into the conversation how you want to change um, and develop the things you make. It's pretty cool. Um, so this 
dedication to low energy use I'm also interested in because there's there's a project that I'm familiar with called Blackle. Um, and it's basically Google, except the colors are inverted. And so it's just the Google search engine, but it's all black. And you can see, let's zoom in over here. So by just changing the background color of Google's website, they claim to have saved 8,259,600. Oh, wait, that's billion. No, that's million. Okay, 800. We were there for it. It's a great day, everyone. Uh, that's a lot of power saved just by using a black background. Um, and black isn't just the color of low power, low energy. Um, black can represent so much more. Um, I'm thinking of, uh, dang, what was the guy that wrote in the dust of this planet? We're gonna get super 2000, 2011 Brooklyn hipster right now. So in the dust of this planet by Eugene Thacker is kind of like this investigation into like how we feel as people because the world's pretty much ending and we can't do anything about it and we're all pretty depressed. So there's this little part where he talks about black metal and what the black and black metal can stand for. And so let's go down the list because I really like this part. Not a good book, not recommending it, but this one part's pretty cool. So black could represent um, kind of the void, like an nihilism. You know, you're not believing in anything at all. It's just darkness. Um, black could represent some kind of primitivism or paganism that uh, indicates a time before there was light, before there was science or organized religion and you can, that's not really like a radical thing either. You can just think about how we refer to the dark ages as dark, even though they weren't like literally dark, even though there might've been an ice age during that time and it might've literally been darker. Sorry, I'm not sure. But um, there's that kind of black. There's also black as a negation of Christianity. I'm talking about black metal here, like Norwegian black metal. Or black could be um, basically like all about Satan or like Satanism. Uh, and when black metal performers create their images and their music, they're not really picking one of these. I mean, you've got your, um, might be called folk metal. You know, they're probably vibing on the, the paganism stuff. And then there's also some like pretty fascist black metal that's, you want to stay away from that stuff. Um, but for the most part, part these bands draw from these multiple interpretations of of black. Um, and I think Rekka and Devine have kind of done something similar with the software that they're producing. Uh, it's black in the sense that it's low power. It's black in the sense that it's a bit anarchist -y and distributed. Um, kind of the low power has like a double meaning where like distributed power means low power across individuals. Um, and then the black is also kind of a, a reference to a time of like monochrome color displays on computers. So like when we look at these things, like Orca or this this other one called Marabu, you know, it's not just black because it's kind of anarchy, anarchisty and they're trying to save power. It's also black because it's like hearkening back to the good old days when we only had, you know, 10 pixels on a screen and wasn't that neat in the phosphorus of the CRT. Wow. Um, no, it's cool. It's cool. Sorry. I'm like, I'm being a little weird about it. Um, anyway, all this stuff is like really exciting. Like when you stumble across a design studio, that's like creating work, that's like crazy focused, uh, and deliberate. It's, it's inspiring me, inspiring to me as someone who makes things. Uh, and it's a great, Thing to show someone else, like a student at Princeton who might be struggling with a design, it's like, should I make this blue or should I make this red? And it's like, okay, well, how about you look deep down into your soul <laughs> and uh, think about what those colors are associated with and are you associated with any of those things? And it gets like pretty navel gazy, introspective, existential crisis, like really quickly, just deciding what kind of color you want to pick. But it's super fun and that's what you have that's 
this time that you're at college, this is what this is all about, you know, waste time trying to choose between colors or choose between forms and figure out what their implications are and all that. Um, cool. So I've been ranting for like 24 minutes and we barely even talked about Orca, but I'm going to head over to the Slack channel real quick to see what you all are talking about. By the way, if anyone's wondering about who I would take on a sailboat with me, uh, it's, there's top, there's top three. So probably, uh, hmm, I guess this is going to sound weird. I hope no one thinks I'm weird, but Pearl from Steven Universe, I think we could have a lot of fun. We could do a lot of we could do a lot of stuff together. Um, she's got this very strict, very deliberate way of uh, going about things. I think that'd be cool. Also, pretty much anyone from Steven Universe, I think, would be cool to hang out with on a sailboat for like a couple months, making you know weird art or weird programs with. Um, Fozzie Bear is also up there. Waka Waka. That's just. My jam, that's never going to get old. He's going to keep me in good spirits all the time. Um, I also kind of have this feeling like he might be able to fish, you know, if we're hungry. He could get us some fish. Um, and then lastly, hands down, Tan Vu. Boom. That guy is out of control. We've got to get on the sailboat sometime and, you know, do some weird stuff. All right, let's look at the Slack channel. Okay, that's cool. Yeah, uh-huh, mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. Okay, there are no questions here, so I don't have any questions to answer. Um, if you have questions, feel free to th throw them in. All right, let's get on to the meat and potatoes of this talk tonight. Here we are. This is Orca. I'm going to show you the, the weird thing that I made. I didn't make anything great. You know, this software... You can do a lot of good stuff with. I'm not doing it justice, um, but maybe you will. Maybe you'll be inspired a little bit, you know? Um, so let me turn this up. You're just gonna get blasted with some good stuff right now. All right, pick your, pick your favorite emoji. What? What emoji represents this music? Can you hear this? Are you are you jamming out? earlier in Ableton, and it's is not happy about it. I've got this, like, hanging note. Um, cool. I got a note. I think it's back. Oh, let's get rid of this. It's pretty fun. Um, okay, I'm, not, I'm never going to use this again, so I hope you all enjoyed what was going on. All right, so in Orca, you um, run this grid, and you have some modules you can use, or operators, functions. Let's see what they call them. So it's Shift-G, wrong, Control-G. Control G, G brings up your uh, cheat sheet, and it tells you what every letter does. Every single letter has something associated with it. So, A outputs sum of inputs. Let's drop an A. Okay, that didn't work, because you didn't know the secret. All of these are lowercase, you gotta do big case. All right, numbers. Favorite numbers in the world. Three, four. Oh, that's seven. It adds them together. And this is 
you're like, why, why would anyone want to do uh, math this way? That's a good question. Um, pretty tricky, uh, but the good thing is whenever, if you look over here in the bottom left, check out this mouse, uh, you get a little cheat sheet. It, it tells you what you're highlighting and then it um, that just tells you and then you drop in the numbers where you see fit. And so that's cool. Okay, we added three and four and got seven. What if we go over 10? Okay, so let's do three and seven. We're gonna hit 10, that's two digits. What's gonna happen? A, what? Where's 10? Where's my boy 10? 10's gone. We are kind of in a pseudo hexadecimal uh, zone with this. We, so hexadecimal is a base 16 system. So basically you count up to 16 before you add on another digit. It goes zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, a, B, C, A, B, C, D, E, F. And then you get to one zero, I think. That's 10, that's 10, that's how you get to 10. But we even get weirder here because if you go to 16, that's eight and eight. Why did that happen? I don't know what's going on. Oh, right, okay, so this is kind of confusing, but 16, 16 is actually 10, okay, in hexadecimal. 15 is F, my mistake. Well, you computer scientists in the audience are, are crying. I'm sorry. Um, this should be 10 in hexadecimal, but we're looking at, we're looking at G, and it goes all the way up there. It gets, it gets kind of fun. I mean, like, why not, if you can only work with a single digit? It's still, it's still a little tricky, Okay, that's kind of the boring stuff. We can do something called C, and this is our counter. Cool, that's gonna count. Um, and then we can uh, change the range of it. Uh, so mod, I think that means, okay, now we're counting up to five, uh, including zero. So zero, one, two, three, four is five, and that will repeat. And then we can change the speed. So if we do two, it's going at half speed, and if we do four, it's going at half half speed. Cool, what can we do with that counter? Well, we can drop in a tracker. Let's see if this works. Okay, almost. Uh, we drop in the tracker, which is capital T. Um, the, left, the left digit says key, and the right digit says length. Uh, let's do a length of eight. Okay, and now we can see this uh, this little dude moving along because the counter is counting through all the steps of the, I don't think this is called tracker. Capital T is, oh. It reads eastward operands, duh, it's not a tracker. So it's going. Um, we, can, we can fill this thing with information. So we can do, that's me. And as we go through, we're going to be stepping through the letters of the alphabet. Um, it's kind of neat. There's so much to know here, and it kind of gets out of control. I just want to show one more thing. Um, so if, you, if you've programmed before, you know about these little things called variables, right? Okay, cool. Hold on, I messed this up. All right, so we got our counter, it's counting. Woo, is it called a counter? No, it's called outputs module frame. Awesome. Uh, and then V is our variable. So the right hand digit is the read. Uh, basically, we're gonna read that number into the variable. And if we want to access that variable later because we've stored a value in it, uh, we type read the value of x through the variable and it cranks out down here. Cool. 
Um, the other thing we can do, because space is so limited in Orca, is we can use the K button. I hope everyone's full screen right now. If you're watching this on YouTube in a little window, you're just... Make it a little bigger. I don't know how to move the screen from here. Oh, here we go. Perfect. Okay. We've got this special uh, operator called K. K lets you plug in multiple, you can read multiple variables at the same time. So X is doing its thing. Let's do another one, but for Y. And obviously this is, I'm being a little sloppy here. I'm sorry about that. Okay. Okay, these are some great comments. Thanks everyone. Uh, we're gonna put in the values X and Y over here. And look, we're reading Y and we're reading X. And they're doing stuff. Um, there's this other, so this is a super cool one. This one's called X. And basically, it's jumping through your, is this the X value? What am I doing? Oh, you know what, I gotta zoom out a little bit. I'm sorry, everyone. Okay, X, X is going here, Y is going here. We can see that as X increases, we're moving through columns. And as Y increases, we're going through rows. All right, so, Orca has this kind of crazy thing called eastwards, move eastward. Uh, and what it is, is it, um, by the way, I, I've avoided this whole talk not mentioning the word bang. Uh, that's because I spent a lot of years of my life like programming in Max MSP, and I don't, I don't want to think about it. Uh, and bang is like the way you trigger a module to do its action. And so what I'm going to show here is this thing that Bangs, look at this, boom, we're banging. It's going, bang, 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 bang. And um, it just, it fires these things out. And you can, this is the thing for reading the information. It's kind of getting out of control. Like how am I, how am I supposed to tell everyone about this? All right, cool, we're jamming. By the way, um, earlier today, I recorded my voice, just a couple weird sounds, um, to get these, to get these samples, and I loaded them into Ableton, chopped them up, normalized them, so that we could enjoy them tonight. Okay, we're getting on 838, so if you've got those questions, start sending them. By the way, Orca is free. You can download it. You can do it. Um, if you don't know what MIDI is, you're probably going to have a hard time. You know, reach out to me. I'll tell you all about. I'll tell you all about MIDI. But right now, we're just we're just trying to chill out. So, uh huh. And um, let's see. This uh, variable information is coming from the two counters that we're we're rocking out with up here. So, so if we change this information to just to just whatever, we're going to change the way these uh, these little dudes come out. I know I missed the... I wonder how we were firing out so many. Cool. Okay, so that was fun. I got one more thing to show all of you, and this is the, the normal jam. You can make normal music, and uh, <laughs> it's not that normal. Um, you can you can basically make things the hard way in Orca. I hope you all can hear me. I hope this isn't too loud. It's kind of hard for me to hear the mixing. Um, so yeah, you can you can do normal stuff. Basically, what I've created over here is a uh, a step sequencer. Um, let's mute some stuff. I don't really know how you go about muting. It's a little tricky, so I'm just gonna delete these. Actually, I want that one there. Oh, whoa. Okay. Um, I have no idea where that sound is coming from. Oh, here it is. Cool. I think this wants to be a C. Awesome. 
Uh, this is a step sequencer, if you all don't know. A step sequencer is composed of 16 steps, and then you can turn those steps on or off, and then they're placed side by side, and then you step through the steps, and what you generate is a sequence, and it's usually over 16, so a lot of electronic music that you know from the 80s or really popular music that has a drum machine. I think I'm using like a a 707, TR-707, it's a it's a famous drum machine, we knew that. Um, but we can, we can chop this up. I'm gonna put in these little X's. Um, let's make it a little bigger. So X, everywhere there's an X, we're gonna hear a bass drum. Um, and I created this using the, the counter that we talked about earlier, and then the tracker, and then this other thing called F. What's F? Good question. F is, bangs if inputs are equal. Um, and so basically we're looking for an input value of X and the tracker is pushing out the information associated with each step right here. So boom, 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 there it is. So when that is X, we're saying, okay, create a bang. And when it creates the bang, this is our, our secret MIDI code that we send over to Ableton Live to create the bass drum sound. And you're like, oh gosh, that's a lot. And it's like, yeah, welcome to welcome to this this stuff. It's actually it's not that difficult once you get used to it. Let me just okay, 42. MIDI is ah, oh, dude, I'm not gonna talk about MIDI. Well, now I'm gonna talk about it. Okay, so MIDI stands for Musical Instrument Digital Interface, and it's a protocol that allows synthesizers, drum machines sequencers, playback devices to all communicate with one another. And it uses a very small uh, data packet to coordinate all of this. Um, the, the data packet, you know, um, it's like four hexadecimal values, which is pretty tiny. So, and they're also seven bits, I think, you know, they're not, they're not eight bits. So you can go between values of zero and 127. Uh, and guess what? That covers all the notes on the keyboard. And guess what? That also kind of covers a dynamic range, zero being inaudible, one being the quietest possible sound, and then 127 being like the loudest that you could press a piano key. So you send those two pieces of information um, from one thing, like the sequencer we're working with, and you use the magic of MIDI to be like, hey, here's this data packet, and you send it to your synthesizer, which in this case happens to be Ableton Live, and the synthesizer goes, hey, 30 years ago, when a bunch of people were sitting around being like, I wish all our synths could talk together, wouldn't it be great, great if we created some protocol that all, all of them understood? Ableton goes, hey, I know what that is, because of that, because of that moment. Um, and it says, I'm going to play the bass drum sound <laughs> because you told me to. Uh, and that's, that's the magic of MIDI. Now, MIDI can be hardware. You can do cables. You can have like physical synthesizers and you plug them all together. Um, but it can also be kind of software based. So I have like another program running in the background that's taking like, uh, a MIDI cable from this program and plugging it into, um, Ableton Live. Uh, let's, so we're, we're almost done here. I'm going to check the Slack real quick. It says full screen. Tiny okay. Wow. No questions. I must be killing it tonight. Just every, I'm saying everything. It's great. Um, let's turn this, let's turn this track on. Not going anywhere without the hi hat. And if for some reason you wanted to change the playback speed of this, we could do that. So let's do half as many bass drums. Oh wait, it's actually <laughs> it's actually doing something kind of weird. But it sounds awesome. Let's see if we can get a whole bunch of snare drums. You can call this beat repeat. Cool. We'll bring in the synthesizer, and that's gonna be it's gonna be the end of this talk.
Um, so I gotta put in this D. Wait a second. Oh, this is great. Cool. That's it. That's it, everyone. Thanks for coming. Um, I can scale this a little bit. Make it a little faster. All right, that's it. That's it, that's the end of the Rad Lab. Cool, thanks for coming everyone tonight. Thanks for, thanks, you know what I meant. Uh, yeah, I hope you like the setup. I got this sweet green screen behind me. Um, you wanna see what, you wanna see behind the, behind the screen real quick? I'm gonna do it. Reveal all my secrets. Boom, that's me. That's me right now, I'm in a green world. Cool. Okay, yeah, thanks everyone, this was really fun. Um, Orca's super rad. I'm looking forward to checking out the rest of uh, Rekka and Devine's programs, and you know, that's kinda it. Okay, so see you around. I'll be hanging around on Slack.